This is the story about the helium, the element which was first discovered in the sun and much later was discovered in the earth. And this is the story also about another inert gases which were hidden in the air in that time. And of course, this is a story about the people. Mainly, this is a story about the people. Let's uh, begin our journey in time and we will start in the year 1955. We are here in Germany, in the city Heidelberg, where in the Heidelberg University in that time the prof was the professor of the chemistry, Robert Bunsen. So, Robert Bunsen uh, invented a burner, which actually named after him a Bunsen burner. That's nothing else, just a mechanism which mix the air and the natural gas and that mixture produced the flame of the hot temperature, of very hot temperatures, about 1500 degrees. And additionally, the flame itself is colorless. Bunsen found that the different chemicals produce a different color of the flame. Basically, if you put uh, sodium, you get a yellow flame. If you put the lithium into the flame, you will get a red color. And the copper will produce the green one. Very great method, he decided, to identify chemical components. You just put the components into their flame and observe the color. Yeah, but that's not so easy. He immediately found that there's a big drawback in this uh, method. It seems like working only for the very, very pure components. So basically, if you have a pure sodium or pure lithium, you can distinguish the color. But if you have a mixture of the two components, it's very hard to distinguish the color. He even tried to use a different color filters to identify it. It doesn't work. But he mentioned that problem to his friend and the colleagues as well. The next hero of our story, Gustav Kirchhoff, who was the professor of the physics in that time, in the same university. As a physicist, he said, I would recommend do not look into the color of the frame, rather look into the spectrum. What is spectrum is? Since the Newton demonstrate that the sunlight is a mixture of the different wave lights, the prism and the spectrum itself had been quite important, play, play quite important uh, role in the physical research. But the Gustav Kirchhoff was the first one who suggested to use the spectrum or the prism in a chemical, in a chemistry. So right after that, Kirchhoff and Bunsen built the very first apparat, which they called the spectroscope. It, they, they actually just took a cigar box, it should work, yeah, put the prism inside, then took the two telescopes, one is point to, pointing to the flame, from the Bunsen burner, and second is used to observe by the naked eye. And if you look into the flame through that spectroscope, you will see the color lines. Actually, these color lines uh, is uh, very unique, like a fingerprint of each element. So basically, by observing the lines, the position of the lines, you can identify the element. So. Even right after that, Bunsen, together with the Kirchhoff, discovered two new elements. Right after, they took the water from somewhere in the near, oh, sorry, in somewhere, and uh, they found in the water two new elements. First, they named cesium, which means uh, sky blue in Greek, and second, they named rubidium, which means dark blue, uh, dark red, sorry, and that was the, name, the names came simply by the colors of the spectrum. So the spectroscopy and the spectroscope became a kind of state of art. So immediately, the all scientists around the world start to use it. Let's leave our two first heroes here and move further. We're now in Paris, year 1868, where the uh, French astronom Julius Janssen preparing himself to the trip to India. In that time, there was the best place to observe the solar eclipse, which happened in that year. Together with all his equipment, which he packed, he also took the spectroscope. His idea was to look into the uh, gases which surround in the sun during the solar eclipse and try to identify the chemicals which is there. 
and he saw the yellow line in the spectrum which he never saw before. Okay, he decided he found a new element and he named it helium, which means in Greek, the sun. So, as I mentioned, Janssen in India saw this yellow line, but another astronomer, actually Norman Locker was the founder of the Natural Journal, did exactly, observed exactly the same yellow line, but he didn't wait until the solar eclipse. He just blocked the sun and pointed the spectroscope into the edge, and he saw exactly the same line. And, funny thing, they both wrote letters to the Paris Scientific Academy, and this letter arrived exactly on the same day. So, 26th of October, 19, 1868, was the day of the discovery of the helium. And to memorize that event, the French ministry even uh, issued the medal to commemorating the discovery of the helium by independently Janssen and the Locke. And you can see here, in one side of the medal, there's two scientists, and another side showing the Apollo as a symbol of the sun. Yeah, but there was always the question since the time, is it real chemical elements, the helium? Can we, be, can we found it? Can we find it in the earth? Is it really exist? There was a lot of debates. Many people even thought that it's not possible. Let's move to the third part of our story. We are now in year 1894. We are in London, in Imperial College, where the Lord Relay set, set himself a task to wait, to wait the gases. So he weighed the oxygen successfully, he weighed the hydrogen also successfully, but once he tried to weight the nitrogen, he got very curious results. So what he did? At, at that time, I also want to mention that, in that time, the, all scientists around the world thought the air consists of the two gases, basically it's nitrogen and oxygen, and additionally, a little bit of carbon dioxide and maybe wet water drops, but mainly it's a nitrogen and the oxygen. So he took the nitrogen from the air and waited. Good. But then, to be safe, he, take, he took the uh, nitrogen from ammonia and also waited. And he got the different results. Basically, the nitrogen from the air was always heavier than the nitrogen from the ammonia. The same element, different weights. Actually, for one liter, the difference was about five milligrams, which is not small. He puzzled. That puzzled him a lot. And he wrote the letter to the Natural Journal, just describe what he saw. And the first one who responds Yeah, was Sir William Ramsey, our next hero, uh, who actually also worked in that time in the Imperial College. He and William Ramsey recalled that when he was a young, when he was a student, he wrote, uh, he read the articles or the notes from another Englishman, Henry Cavendish. Maybe you all uh, know him mainly as a as a. Dis, uh, uh, discover of the hydrogen. So, Henry Cavendish was quite, quite a man, this eccentric genius who lived in the 18th century. He was a quite lonely man. He devoted himself to the science. And in one of his experiments, Ramsey read the following thing. Cavendish took a bended tube filled with oxygen and the air, placed it upside down in the glasses with the mercury, and pass the electrical sparks through. Normally, the all gases, which is nitrogen and the oxygen, what he saw, should go away and the mercury should fill the whole tube because of the oxidized process. But it was always in his experiment the residual bubble in the middle. Whatever he did, there was always the residual bubble. In that time, Cavendish didn't really understand what he saw. But Ramsey, in 100 years later, was that, give, that gives him an idea that maybe there is something else in the air. And together with Lord Relay, uh -huh. one more time. 
No, it doesn't work. Yep, good. So, uh, as I said, together with Ro uh, Lord Relay, Ramsey decided to reproduce Cavendish experiment, but in a bigger scale. They took a very huge gas, uh, glass bo uh, bottle and passed a very high voltage through these two electrodes. Actually, it was about seven kilovolts even. And the all nitrogen and the oxygen due to oxidized process was passed away through the tubes. And residual gas they analyzed with a spectroscope. That wasn't yet the helium. The gas, what they found it, they named argon, which means lazy from the Greek. That was the first actually inert gas which was found in the Earth. So whatever they tried, this gas was not react with any component, with any chemical component. So it's simply restrict to react. It was not give any reaction to the electricity, to the heat. So completely inert. Good. Uh, a bit later, in America, uh, the American uh, geologist, geologist named Hildebrand uh, got a very puzzled result. He took the uranium ore and uh, observed that there is some gas going out. And this gas looks like an argon, so basically it's, it was not react with anything as well. He, report, or he wrote a letter to Ramsey about that, and Ramsey was trying to replicate it. So tried to, 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 he found another piece of the uranium ore and uh, got the gas out of it. It wasn't the argon, it was the helium. By the spectroscopy, they identify exactly the same yellow line as uh, Janssen and uh, Norman saw 20 years ago. That was the first time when the helium was d discovered in the Earth. Actually, quite a long, quite a, quite a while after that, uh, scientists thought that uh, the only source of the helium in our planet is this uranium ore. They have thought that the helium in some way associated with this metal. Of course, now we all knew that the helium was going out due to the radioactive uh, process, basically. And that's why in every uranium ore you can find the helium right now. So, the picture of the air become more complete now, together with the nitrogen, we have the oxygen, or together with the nitrogen and oxygen, we now have the argon. But Ramsey thought, if the helium can be found in the uranium ore, maybe we can take a look more carefully in the air as well. So what he did, he produced enough of argon with the same experiment, like I described before, this uh, bigger Cavendish experiment, and liquefied, so make it liquid out of it. And then, by analyzing a different fractions during the evaporation, they immediately find two new gases. First, they discover there is a muon in the air. They name it after Greek means mu. Then, they discover another gas and they name it krypton, which means uh, hidden by the Greek. And in the end, success, they got a helium. They also found the helium in the air. Actually, that was not the last gas which they found. They found even another one more, xenon, which means stranger from the Greek. So the liquid argon was not the argon. It was a mixture of the five gases. So that's the periodical table as we know it now. And you can see that the last column which represent the inert gases, was mainly founded by the last, last two decades of the 19th century by Ramsey. And now the picture of the air completed. You can see that together with the oxygen and the nitrogen, we have five more inert gases in the air. Even in this room where we're breathing, you breathe in and breathe out the argon. Quite a lot, actually. It's about... 10 to 20 cubic centimeters. 
but because it's inert, it doesn't react with anything in our body and it easily goes out. That's the end of my story. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anton. So are there some questions? What would you like to learn more about helium or argon or something else? Yes, there's a question. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I'm curious if they, if they tried already at that time to use or to, like, to use these gases somehow? It's a good question, actually. They're not, no, okay. And that, as I said, it's a, it's a, it's the end of 19th century. In that time, they don't really know how to use it. But in the beginning of 20th century, the helium start play significant role. Basically, the, uh, the how do I call it, uh, the zeppelin, right? Which played a major role in the First World War, was filled with the helium. And the source of the helium was a quite a important uh, resource. So the people fight for the helium. Yeah. Yes, please. Where is it used nowadays? So yeah. Nowadays, uh, how is it used? So the question is if it's used somewhere nowadays. Well, I think it's. And where? Uh, the helium is the as I don't know. Helium is the gas which have the lowest uh, melting temperature, so it became liquid in minus two hundred twenty, minus two hundred seventy three or seventy two, and. Uh, he played in that area of the physics a quite a role. So basically, a lot of effects such as uh, superconductivity was mainly discovered with with this gas. What else? Huh? Zero viscosity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Balloons. Very balloons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in, in every. Uh, happy and every birthday, uh, you can find it. Some more questions? I, I have. Yes, please. Um, I have a question in general about inert gases, lack of chemistry knowledge here. Don't remember school. Why don't they react with anything? Say again. Why don't they react? Okay, if I have time, I can explain it. You have a bit. Yes. A bit. Okay. One good. minute. Is it's good. quite. I mean, actually, I try to explain it in a very easy way. Uh, every atom consists of the two parts: it's the nuclear and the electrons. And electrons, they are distribute by some kind of orbits. And there's this, you can, you can, you can think about like etages, like a stores. And uh, like say, in the first etage, there's only two electrons possible. In the second etage, there's only six electrons possible. And when the all electrons are filled, like for example, the helium is the second one in the periodical table, it have only two electrons, but it's like complete etage. It doesn't like to give the electron and it doesn't like to take the electrons. Same with the next element. So basically when you fill the next etage, there will be a, sorry, there will be a argon, right? So it's like elements where the etages with the electrons completely filled. So they don't like to take the electrons and they don't like to give the electrons. Mm -hmm.